What I want to do is answer one question that's been hitting me in the halls uh, from various people. I don't want to disturb you, but, and it's, it's the chronology thing in the life of Christ. I know it's, uh, we're backtracking just a shade here. Uh, I keep talking about 33 AD as the date for Good Friday and, uh, and Easter, and uh, doesn't this make Jesus too old in terms of Luke saying he, he's about 30? Uh, if he's born in 5 BC, you add that then to 33, and do we have a 38-year-old at Calvary? No. Uh, top would be 36. Why? Because there's no year zero. Uh, when you run into 4, 3, 2 B.C., 1 B.C., the next year is 1 A.D. So there's no zero year, and that saves you two years right there. Then... Uh, Luke 3 is, is, of course, gives us a double chronological anchor. On the one hand, Luke says, you know, in the 15th year of the Emperor Tiberius, that's the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry. And then he goes on to say Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, was about 30 years of age. Now, Luke says about 30 years of age, and everybody's forgotten the about, and they've all zoomed in on 30. And the result is New Testament scholarship has been hopelessly skewed, in the wrong direction on that. Uh, they have, by hook or crook, tried to get Jesus no more than 30 years of age at that point, and they all know he's born about 5 BC, and so what they did was the talk of an overlap in emperorship between Tiberius and Augustus. The last two years of Augustus's life, from 12 to 14, would be a co-regency with Tiberius. And therefore, the 15th year of the Emperor Tiberius would then come to 27 AD rather than 29, and that then brings us Jesus safely at age 30 at the beginning of his ministry. Uh, that's the wrong first aid for Luke, who doesn't need any. Uh, there's no way in any Roman source that speaks of a co-regency like that. Here you have Christian theologians have simply having gone off in their own direction, ignoring Roman history. No way would Tiberius ever poach for his own dates on those of the father of his country, Augustus. Tiberius himself very unpopular. Uh, Tiberius following Augustus was Richard Nixon following George Washington. And there's no way that they had a co-regency. That's ridiculous. So all you do is let Luke be Luke. Luke says, Jesus was about 30 years of age. I did a word study on hosai in Greek, which is as if or about, means the same thing as in English. And Luke's using it all over the place. Jesus fed about 5,000 people. Now you and I know there could have been 4,912, there could have been 5,122. About meaning the nearest integer. That's all it means. So Jesus is actually 32 and a half when Luke wrote that. That's about 30. End of problem, he says confidently. Um, any other questions on the material just covered or anything up to now before we now zoom into what's happening at the end of the book of Acts? Yes. Okay, the question is, do we have any uh, extra biblical materials on the disciples, the followers of Jesus, um, outside of the New Testament? The answer is that uh, Paul himself of Tarsus is not mentioned, nor is Peter, nor the disciples, but uh, the brother of Jesus is mentioned. Uh, James shows up in Josephus at a couple of critical points. And in fact, they define him, James, as the brother of Jesus. Uh, so that clearly shows that uh, Josephus has been talking about him. But again, no detail other than the stoning of, Stephen to de uh, stoning of uh, James to death in 62 A.D. Yes? When the veil of the temple was rent, is there any evidence that they repaired into the sacrifices cease? Uh, we don't know. We think that they probably did repair it, yes. You know, they had Betsy Rosses in those days, too. Uh, and uh, the, the sacrifices did not cease until the Romans conquered Jerusalem in the year 70, so they resumed, yes. Anything else?
else, yes. Yes, you can. A uh, question is when the veil of the temple is rent, there was an earthquake also, and you can see the split at Golgotha to the present day. Answer is yes. Uh, under the, uh, the, the cupola dome at the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, when you look through the windows at Golgotha, you can see a, a, a cleft in the rock. Whether that's the very cleft or not, who knows? Because, you know, stones have a way of splitting. I understand even a stone statue here recently had that problem. Okay, idolaters, let's move ahead. Uh, <laughs> Paul takes the sea voyage, at, uh, you know, Acts 25, 26, 27, fabulous detail there. Even critical classicists say that this is the finest description of a sea voyage in history. It is the most accurate sea, sea description to survive from the ancient world. It answers perfectly the Mediterranean commerce as we know it, the counterclockwise shipping that went on in the Mediterranean. Counterclockwise because the winds are northwesterly. Uh, you take off from Rome, sail down between the straits, you just let the sails fly two weeks and you're in Alexandria because of the northwesterlies. Perfect flying before the wind. When you try to go back against that blast, it's a little difficult. You've got to do a lot of coast hopping uh, up through the coast of Palestine, Syria, then under Anatolia, Asia Minor, Turkey. And uh, Paul's ship had trouble uh, plying the Aegean. I, I will say, every time we've been to the Aegean, there's always been a fierce north wind blowing. The thing can get terribly choppy, and Paul's ship encountered the same thing. So they tried to use Crete as an umbrella to shield that northerly. And that's, of course, when it was late in the sailing year, and Paul warned him not to go any further. He knew his maritime schedules. He was born in Tarsus. That's only seven miles from the Mediterranean. And as you know, they didn't listen to him. And they got this horrendous east-northeaster that hit him, the Euroclidon, it's called. And their description of what they did to the ship to keep it floating is just fabulous. Uh, they, they struck the sails down, they lowered their gear, they threw away, you know, lifeboats and everything else, trying to lighten the ballast. The, the whole uh, cargo goes overboard, and they finally uh, land on the island of Malta, spend the winter there, and then they set sail. And Luke gives us an exacting geography of southern Italy. They put in at Syracuse, they hit Regium, they go up to Puteoli, Port of Naples. And then Paul gets there, and then he's welcome to Rome. And then he tries his message on the synagogue, same deal. Turns from them to the Gentiles, same deal. And then the book of Acts ends with those famous words. And Paul dwelt two years in his own hired house, preaching the kingdom of God openly to all who would listen. And then what? And then what, Luke? You know, oh, I... Every time I go through the book of Acts, I, I still get frustrated at that close. I, you know, Luke is telling us such a beautiful, adventurous, fascinating account that we're waiting for the climax. What about Paul's trial before Nero? That's what we're gearing up to. Why did Paul take two years before he could even get his hearing? Uh, it is what we call an unresolved fade out. It's a very modern device. You get it all the time in television. You know, the more interesting the plot, the, le the less it seems to be resolved lately. And it's 10 o'clock in the evening and the credit lines are rolling and you're waiting for the news. And once again, you've been had. Uh, no ending. A modern novelist use it all the time, especially when they don't know how to end their own plots. was not too biblical. Now, on the one hand, Luke accomplished everything he set out to do, and that is to tell how the good news went from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, namely Rome. He, had, he, he, he came through with his end of the bargain. I'm not criticizing Luke. All I'm saying is, boy, wouldn't it be fun if we could try to extrapolate on the basis of the, the information that we now have, the fuller story. 
And it is possible to do that, and that's the reason for this otherwise strangely named Flames of Rome project of mine. Uh, the original name for that book was uh, Acts 29 Following. Second book of Acts, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, a little presumptuous to call it that. And, you know, uh, only graduates of St. Paul Bible College would have understood uh, what I was talking about. So we went to the Flames of Rome instead. But what it is, is an extrapolated conclusion to the book of Acts to finish a story. Which just about can be done now, because we have enough information from the Christian sources, from the Roman legal sources, from the Roman imperial sources, from the catacombs and elsewhere, to finish off the account. And it turns out to be a fascinating account because I think 20 of the most colorful years in human history were wrapped about that time of the fire of Rome. Um, and wouldn't you know it, if we check into God's backup systems, as I like to call them, history and archaeology, we have sources picking right up where Luke left off. So there's hardly any gap whatever. Luke signs off at 62 AD. The great fire of Rome happened in 64, so Cornelius Tacitus picks it up after a two and a half year lapse and that's all. He then describes what happened to the Christians when they made their baldly grotesque public debut on the persecution stage in Rome. That's what happened afterwards and what a story it was. Okay, why did Paul have to wait two years? Not very normal for Roman justice to drag a hearing out that long. Typical of American justice to wait for two years. Oh yeah, that's, that's par for our course. Uh, Roman justice is swifter. I give you the case of one Jesus of Nazareth who's brought into court at uh, dawn and he's crucified by noon. That's a little too fast. But uh, uh, he wasn't a Roman citizen. He couldn't get a fair hearing. Uh, Roman citizens, though, also didn't wait two years. Justice delayed is justice denied. So why is Paul waiting two years? There is a reason. And to explain it, I've got to do a brief flashback into what's been happening now in Roman history. Meanwhile, throughout the book of Acts, you've got two emperors in charge. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the later book of Acts. Claudius from 41 to 54 AD and then Nero from 54 to 68. Claudius wraps over the first two missionary journeys of Paul. Nero is in charge after the third and the voyage to Rome. And those really are two colorful characters. You may have uh, come to learn and appreciate Claudius from the I, Claudius series in television uh, some months ago in public broadcasting. Uh, himself not a bad administrator. He had motor handicaps. He had a hard act to follow, uh, Augustus and Tiberius. Not crazy boots Caligula. Um, his own mother, though, called him something that Mother Nature began to work on but never finished. Imagine from Mama herself to hear a comment like that. And of course, everybody else made fun of his love life or his stuttering. They called him Cluck Cluck Claudius behind his back and so on. <laughs> but uh, he showed him. He conquered Britain for Rome, you know. Who'd have thought the old pedant would have accomplished that? But he did. Uh, and he was a pretty good administrator, be it said. Um, the Roman Empire was enjoying the Pax Romana at that time, and things were pretty well organized. But poor Claudius had trouble with the ladies. Oh, yeah, gee. Uh, his first wife was a, a murderous Amazon of a woman uh, who is about as ugly as her name, Urgulanilla. Um, something out of the Minneapolis Zoo. Uh, for, for reasons of personal safety alone, he divorced her. Um, second wife, kind of colorless. The third wife, though, oh, ho, ho, the third wife was named Messalina. A great name for her because she was messing around all the time. Uh, behind his back, you can't believe. Now, I know adultery at the summit is not unknown, but, but this girl was heroic in her practice thereof. Um, 
you know nineteen hundred years later even though they tried to subdue the evidence we have the names of sixteen senators with whom she was unfaithful and that was only the senatorial class her tastes were very broad went down the ranks um, an unusual woman a true nymphomaniac uh... one day uh... when claudius was at the mediterranean seashore supervising the dredging of a harbor Messalina pulled something that I have never seen ever done anywhere in history. Without bothering to divorce her dear husband or tell him, she publicly marries somebody else in the city of Rome at a public wedding. Uh, you know, bigamy at the summit. And they finally had to tell Claudius, and he comes back and just about falls apart, uh, you know, thinking his wife had been faithful the whole time and then finding out what she really was horrendous for the poor guy heads rolled the conspiracy was overthrown and Claudius then swears celibacy for the rest of his life never the women have been a curse in his life he's going to remain a bachelor it was true to that vow for the next seven months um, <laughs> until Agrippina his niece comes on the scene and she seduces Uncle Claudius, and they get married. Now, uncles and nieces should not do that. Uh, that's called incest. And the Romans called it incest also, but they got a special law passed by the Senate permitting Uncle Claudius to marry niece Agrippina. They want to keep all that power in the Julian family, you know, and not let it get diluted. So far, so good or bad. Um, Agrippina brings to this wedding, however, a little gift, and that is a son by a previous marriage kid named Nero who's 13 and a half and Claudius had his own son whom he named in honor of his British victory a kid named Britannicus he's only 10 and now mama turns the household into a real can of worms here in favoring her beloved Nero and uh, she hired Seneca to teach him Gallio's brother and scanting you know any chances for uh, Britannicus son up and he says you're gonna be the next Caesar and Mama overhears that. And that's why late in October of the year 54, she prepared her famous uh, mushroom dinner for husband Claudius. The mushrooms were not poisoned mushrooms. They were poisoned mushrooms. Get the difference? And uh, Claudius ate a couple of them, and his head hit the plate. Uh, this is a way really to do away with your enemies in those days. This is before Quincy and the lab people come along. You know, they, 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 they don't know, you know, you have to affect the sickness. Uh, and uh, that didn't kill Claudius. So about midnight then they come with the feather, you know, and, and uh, for the obvious, uh, to tickle his throat. But the doctor was in the conspiracy, so the feather was coated with the second strongest poison that they knew in uh, the Roman medicine box. And Claudius gagged and almost stopped breathing, but uh, didn't die. And near morning, he's coming around again. You will not believe how they did him in. You won't ever see this paralleled, I think, in any other literature. They turned him over. They killed him with a poison enema. Got him at both ends. There's no way that the guy's going to survive this one. And that is how Claudius Caesar died. Now, um, I, I told you this is unparalleled type of history. Uh, you know, previously I thought the most exotic death was in Hamlet, where somebody pours poison to somebody's ear, you know? I thought that's kind of wild, but, well, ear, rear, whatever. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this is how Nero becomes emperor, over the poisoned flesh of his poor stepfather. And for the first five years, Rome is a model government. Everything's going beautifully. Why? Because Nero isn't governing. He's growing up. He's drag racing chariot through Rome. And it's, uh, it's uh, Seneca, stoic philosopher and brother of Gallio, who is running the show. He is the intelligence behind the throne. And the later Emperor Trajan said that Rome never had a better government than those five years, from 54 to 59, which explains 
why Paul will happily appeal to Caesar. So you may wonder, why does St. Paul appeal to Nero? Because, you know, we all know what Nero became. Well, nobody knew that then yet. See? Very fair government under Seneca. Now, everything changes in the year 59. What? Nero's going to rule for himself now. So Seneca backs off and still gives his advice, but very diplomatically handles Nero nicely. But Mama doesn't. Mama Agrippina keeps telling Nero, you wouldn't be emperor for today if it weren't for me, you wouldn't be emperor today if it weren't for me, and so forth, which is true, but nobody likes to hear it once you're emperor. And Mama sasses Nero, they have these horrible dog fights, and one day, it looks as though Mama is plotting against her own son. She has uh, members of the Praetorian Guard in for happy hour, you know, and they discuss plots, and De Nero then has to decide on an ultimate solution to the problem of his own mother. First, he tried the old collapsible bedroom ceiling ploy. <laughs> Romans loved their gadgets. And uh, they had redone Mama's ceiling with concrete panels that would drop out at the pull of a lever. And Mama came back from her country estate, and somebody tipped Mama off. So she spent that night in the john. And, uh, and sure enough, about 3 a.m., the ceiling opens up and smashes what was, you know, her bed beyond recognition. Now she, of course, is ready to denounce Nero before the Roman Senate, and Nero knows that he might be in big trouble now. So he writes a letter to Mama, pleading for her forgiveness, admitting his guilt, and now he wants to be a dutiful son from here on in, and would Mama please come down to Nero's uh, summer pad on the, uh, on the Bay of Naples for a feast of reconciliation. Mama believed him and went down to uh, the Mycenaeum Promontory, which is the uh, western end of the Bay of Naples. That's where the emperor's at a summer palace. Had a beautiful final, I don't want to say final, that's getting ahead of the story, had a beautiful dinner together. Uh, at midnight, Nero takes Mama off to the wharf there and bids her goodbye because Mama's got to sail across the bay to her motel, which is five miles over. Now, the ship that Mama used is described by Tacitus, our main source once again, as a collapsible cabin cruiser. <laughs> they, they couldn't get Mama by poison because Mama, you know, she, oh, she had three or four antidotes before cornflakes every morning. I mean, it was just, just automatic. I mean, she knew more of poisons than anybody else. And so it's got to be an accident, a drowning at sea, okay? Now, the collapsible part of this cabin cruiser was a trap door that would open in the hull and scuttle the ship. The crew would swim to shore and Mama would drown. Then Rome would go into mourning. Okay, in the middle of the bay, they pull the lever and the trap door refuses to budge because the idiots had put the hinge on the wrong side. <laughs> They had this thing opening out <laughs> instead of opening in. See, if they opened in the thing, it would have been a plume of water, but nothing at all. It worked fine in dry dock, see? Anyway. Uh, so since they can't budge the trap door, they decide to scuttle the ship by running to the starboard rail and the port rail. Starboard, get her rocking, you know, and, and get her that way. <laughs> And while the ship is rocking, the crew comes storming out of the hold because they hadn't been told the plot. They thought their officers had suddenly gone stark raving mad. So they then ran to the opposite rails each side to keep the ship floating. <laughs> now in this stupid melee, Mama, who once again realizes her son is up to no good, jumps off the ship and swims away with bold strokes because, surprise, Mama's a good swimmer. 1 a.m., a flotilla of oyster fishermen see something swimming in the water, and they haul Mama out safely into the boat and deliver her reverently to the motel on shore. For his part, Nero is now fit to be tied. He seriously wonders 
if his mother is a goddess. Because, as he put in Latin, how in the world can you kill the old bitch? Uh, here she is, impervious to any such attempts. And so he calls in the Marines, and they surround Mama's motel, and clubbed her to death the next morning. March 20th in the year 59 AD. Now all this is an answer to why Paul had to wait two years for his trial. Why? If I told you that probably that very evening Paul's ship was also coming into the Bay of Naples, you would throw your hymnals at me, so I won't say that. But I will say that there is an incredible close flyby here between those two ships. Maybe not that night, but this thing happens, it seems, within 36 hours of one another. Why do I say that? The rules of Roman navigation. The Romans closed the Mediterranean to shipping for winter until March 10th. That is when Secura Navigatio begins. That's once again when the Mediterranean is reliable. You do that any earlier and it would vi vitiate maritime insurance. Paul is wintering in Malta three months. November, December, no, December, January, and February. Then they set sail. Most scholars conclude that he came to Rome in the spring of 59 AD. The opening for winter sailing is March 10th. Acts 28 tells us that it took him nine days to stop at Syracuse, Regium, and get up to the Bay of Naples in Puteoli. The 19th of March, then, if all the rules are being observed, is when Paul sailed into the Bay of Naples. The 19th of March was the second day of the Feast of Ceres when Nero wined and dined his mother five miles to the west. I know, I know it's a coincidence that even Charles Dickens wouldn't use, but we're dealing with fact here and not fiction, and truth is so much stranger than fiction, it's unbelievable as witnessed that mama in the Mediterranean episode. Now, whether it was that night, who cares? What I am saying is that the next morning, Nero is so conscience-stricken by what he had done, matricide, he had killed his mother, that he was afraid to return to Rome. He was afraid they would stone him to death. And so he did not get back to Rome for about the next year. And then when he did get back, he had so much business backed up for him that he uh, it couldn't tend to the case of an obscure provincial. This most probably explains the two-year wait. Nero wasn't even available to handle Paul's case at that time. All because of these incredibly florid, colorful, lurid, uh, goings on at the Imperial Summit. Now, when Paul does stand before Nero, what about that trial? I think it is possible to extrapolate that trial by this time, even though it's not been done before. Um, I have 38 pages of scholarly notes at the back of Flames of Rome trying to demonstrate that that middle event in the book, the trial of Paul before Nero, is most probably the way it happened. The same three charges against Paul would have been carried through at Nero's tribunal. And Nero's conduct at the tribunal is also predictable on the basis of the other cases that crossed his judicial docket. And we know how Nero acted at these trials. We know the nature of the board of assessors or fellow jurors who helped him decide. And computing all that together, we arrive at at least a good 50-50 chances that this is the way it really happened. It may come as something of a surprise when I announce my conviction that Paul beat the rap the first time he stood before Nero. There's more and more evidence that Paul was acquitted the first time in Rome. For openers, Christians were not illegal in the Roman Empire as of 62 AD, or 63 even, when the trial took place. They were perfectly legal, not officially, but the Romans themselves 
contrary to what you see in so many popular novels and movies, were quite a fair-minded people, not so horrendously brutal as they're often pictured. You know, uh, in, in all of our no biblical novels, you know, with some exceptions, uh, the, the Romans are pictured as this bloodthirsty group who set fire to all villages they pass through and rape all the women, steal all the jewels, and move ahead. Um, no, no, that's not what St. Paul says. That's not what the Bible says. Every time Paul talks to a Roman governor, he's very respectful, he's very thankful, he's very deferent, he's appreciative of what the Romans are doing in the Mediterranean world. They brought law and order for sure. So much so that Paul can go by land and by sea without, you know, uh, interruption. Something that could never have happened in the previous century when Rome was getting its internal act organized. And as far as the Romans being this, these horrible people who, who juiced you out of all your tribute and this kind of thing, hey, I would much rather pay Roman provincial tribute than American income tax. Much rather. Uh, so lots worse things could happen to you than be conquered by Rome. And Rome was syncretistic. The more religions the merrier, they don't care. They got everything there. They got native animism, they've got uh, Zeus and all the gods that the Greeks freighted over to them, they've got Isis and Osiris from Egypt, they've got Magna Mater from Asia Minor, Sibylle, uh, they've got uh, uh, Mithraism, they've got Sol Invictus, they've got all these cults and groups. The Jews were given uh, virtual freedom in the Roman Empire, so why not a Jewish sect like the Christiani? That's what they were deemed as at first. So there's no legal reason and Paul could have made a brilliant defense for himself. Luke already has a deposition, don't you kid yourself, from Agrippa. Remember when Paul is before Felix and Festus in Caesarea? What does King Agrippa say? He says, hey, this man could have been released if he had an appeal to Caesar. He's done nothing wrong. Don't think Luke isn't copying that down and using that deposition. And you know, if, uh, if you believe that Paul offered the pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, well then you better agree with me that Paul beat the rap the first time, because there's just no way to fit the pastorals uh, into his ministry if it ends the first time he stands before Nero. No way. So it does seem, and again from the evidence of the Muratorian fragment in the canon, uh, and many other claims that Paul could indeed have made a post-imprisonment trip to Spain, not a long ministry there, a final swing through the eastern Mediterranean. This is where Crete gets involved in Titus and so on. And then got arrested a second time. Second Timothy gives us the background on that one. And a second time, there's no chance that he's going to survive. Because the Christians then, around 65, 66, are now illegal. Why? Because of this crazy fluke called the Great Fire of Rome. That's why. If I would ask you to give me the one-liner on Nero that you've all heard of, you give me this one, right? You know, all, everybody knows Nero fiddled while Rome burned. And it's too bad that that popular slogan has two giant mistakes. Uh, one is not the fiddle. The violin will not be invented for 11 centuries yet. And Nero also was not the arsonist who set fire to Rome. It was, we can now clearly demonstrate, an accidental fire that got out of hand because the Scirocco, the south wind, was blowing and took what was only a local conflagration and enlarged it into this thing that scorched the center of Rome. And Nero got blamed for it only because people always tend to blame the top man in any catastrophe. You can ask Herbert Hoover about that. Um, this is before public opinion is well informed. There is no evening TV show, no Roman Dan Rather who with his minicam can show you where the flames began there in southeastern Rome. Uh, you instead have Rome a rumor factory uh, without ad adequate information. 
People have got to blame someone after a catastrophe like that. It's human nature to do so. It's human psychology to want to do so. Especially when Nero, although he looked good during the fire, he's bringing all kinds of first aid and so forth. He's looking very noble, actually, during the fire. But right after that, Nero chooses 120 choice acres in the burnt-out district downtown as the location for his massive new palace. He calls it the Golden House. The largest structure for human habitation put up by man until Louis XIV's Versailles, southwest of Paris. And people suddenly started putting two and two together. Nero is commandeering all this property. He's getting it at a fire sale price. Probably the fire was Nero's slum clearance project without benefit of bulldozer, huh? And the graffiti start appearing on the wall. It is an actual one in translation. To understand it, Vei is a northeastern suburb of Rome. Or, no, about five miles away from Rome. A house of gold is swallowing Rome. Well, let's flee to Vei and make it our home. But the palace, it grows so much faster than hell that soon it'll swallow up Vei as well. Pardon the profanity, but it's in the Latin. Uh, Nero now sees these things and uh, concludes that the government is indeed very shaky and there is murmuring in the air and there is a revolution in the air. And to save himself, they then decide to shift the blame. And they probably went through the various unsavory types of people. The criminals of Rome, they probably suggested first. But they knew the moment that they tried the criminals that they would then turn state's evidence and embarrass the government even more. How about the Jews of Rome? Periodically they did have a crackdown against the Jews because of their internal dissension. Claudius for a while excluded the Jews temporarily, as you well know. That's what brought Aquila and Priscilla to Corinth with Paul, remember? At that point, Papia, the empress of Rome, intervened and said, no way will it be the Jews, because she was interested in Judaism. She was what they call a God-fearer, on the way to becoming a proselyte, believe it or not. So she protects the Jews. But once you're on that frequency, folks, you know what's next in line. How about this special sect of Jews, these Christers, these Christiani? Oh, perfect. They probably thought there were maybe 50 Christians in Rome, just about the size you need for a gang of arsonists. Pin the blame on them. And so they were arrested. And then to their horror, they discovered that they had now bid off more than they had bargained for. That instead of a few dozen, hundreds were being round up. They didn't realize that the church was growing that mightily in Rome. But the government's got to cover its tracks. The bigger lie has got to cover the smaller one. So they went along with it. And the Christians then have this grisly appearance on the stage of Rome indeed, in the Hippodrome, where they are treated to the most ghastly tortures invented by man sewn inside of animal skins and made to fight with live animals, uh, subject to the appetites of packs of yapping hounds descending on them, beheaded, crucified, and the ghastliest of all, I think, is when daylight failed, they chained them to posts, daubed them with pitch, and set them on fire for nocturnal illumination so the games could continue. This first horrendous persecution then unfortunately becomes par for the Roman course from here on, regrettably. The government didn't go back as it should have and, and declared the lie. And the Christians are going to be illegal from that point on for about the next two and a half centuries. And it won't be until the time of Constantine, 311, 313 AD, that they finally officially legalized Christianity.
from then on, the heat is going to be on and off, on and off. Uh, we don't want to say that from here on, the Roman Empire fearfully, constantly persecuted the Christians. There were times when the heat was off, like the second century AD, except for a few strategic martyrdoms like Polycarp and others. Generally, the church was fairly well left alone. But then, as Rome goes downhill, as Rome starts falling apart, they again need to blame somebody. And the Christians then in the third century AD got fearfully persecuted uh, when they set up empire-wide dragnets. And all from this fluke, the fire of Rome. Or was it a fluke? Again, in God's economy, this is his pruning operation, it turns out, because that very persecution ends in the triumph of conversion on the part of the Romans who wonder how can the Christians possibly want to give their life for their gods or for their God. Poor people have only one. Uh, the Romans would never do that for Father Jupiter or Mother Juno or anybody else. Are you kidding? How can the Christians do this? Even Tacitus tells us of that earliest persecution, 64, that um, a feeling of miseratio, pity, starts welling up from the Roman masses who wonder if indeed the Christians have been singled out as scapegoats and are gangs of arsonists really that large. So, you see, even in setback, you can probably see the hand of God there, so that, as Tertullian put it, the blood of martyrs turned out to be, indeed, the seed of the church. And it ended by conquering the greatest power the world itself had ever known, the Roman Empire. Add it all up, and you can see that quite a bit happened after the book of Acts leaves off. And you can see why Luke is no longer writing. In the, under the horrible pressure of the church and the persecution. And uh, whether or not he ever wrote a third treatise to Theophilus, I'll never know. But what a document that could be if it were ever found. Okay, any questions? Yes? Okay, what about Paul's claim in Romans that the, their faith is heard of all over the world? How come the Roman government wouldn't know that? Paul is using the usual exaggeration here. Obviously, the faith wasn't heard yet in China or New Zealand and so on. It means the Roman world. It means the empire. And when it's talked of all over the empire, he's talking about the other Christian churches being proud of what their Roman brothers and sisters are doing. Certainly not the imperial government. Well, the Romans knew about the Christians, yes. It's just that they made a bad guess that there weren't that many in Rome. And by the way, they limited the persecution, it seems, just to Rome, not, not the rest of the empire at that time. I couldn't be sure of that, though. And that's why probably First Peter was written. See, Peter gets to Rome shortly before the great persecution, just in time to catch it. And uh, he would not have been beheaded like St. Paul was. He was probably crucified. Probably not head downward like you hear. There's enough evidence now that Peter did get to Rome, I think, that we better agree with that. Uh, it used to be the old ultra-Protestantizing ploy against the Catholics to say that, you know, Peter went to Babylon. He never went to Rome, so how can he be the first pope and so on and so forth. There are better ways of arguing against some of the claims of the papacy than using that argument, which isn't really very sharp. Because Babylon was the, the code name for Rome among the early Christians. And there's just too much evidence. I, I list it all in the back of the book. I say the evidence against Peter's going to Rome is as follows, and then another paragraph, the evidence for Peter going to Rome is as follows, and there's about seven times as much information uh, that he went there. Oh, yeah, most scholars are sure that Peter did not establish the Roman church, no. He came later to the, an already functioning Roman church, yes. Because it's clear that that thing is already remarkably established when Paul writes the epistle to the Romans, before Peter got there. 
Yes, question. Was there a persecution because of the fire or because they believed in God? Probably all of the above. It began as an accusation for arson. But then even Tacitus says that they were fearfully persecuted, not so much only because of the charge of arson, but because of odium humani generis, the odium of the human race, hatred of the human race. See, they were regarded as a bunch of cultists with their weird rites. They eat the body and drink the blood of their God. And where do they get these ingredients? They kill little babies and drain them. You know, horrible rumors like that. So they, they seem like a bunch of weirdos. And they're kind of looking for an excuse, you see. So the arson thing was probably, you know, the opening wedge. Yes? Where does the Roman historian get this information without fear of his own life? Oh, okay. Uh, you mean all the person who lets all of Nero's dirty laundry be exhibited? Yeah. Uh, a generation afterwards. Tacitus, Cornelius Tacitus, was eyewitness to some of this, but his, only as a child. As an adult, he was able to write in the Flavian era and in the era of Trajan. And he's one of the five good emperors. And so there was freedom of the press in those days, even though it's only 20, 30 years after Nero. There was freedom then. And everybody knew by that time Nero was, you know, absolutely a, a dirty bird. So uh, it, it makes the later emperors look good even, you know, against that background. So they permitted him to write, sure. Good question, though. Good question. Yeah. What happened to Nero's mother? Nero's, oh, Britannicus, I'm sorry. Oh, that poor kid. Oh, oh, just, just three months into Nero's reign, Mama was still making a big fuss over him. And so one evening, they gave the kid a cup of very hot wine. Now, it's good wine because, hey, the wine was tasted like all the food. All those princes had the, the things tasted first. And it was good wine. It was too hot for the kid, so he wants it to be cooled down with water and, you know, potassium cyanide or something inside the water. And uh, he took one, one quaff of that and his head hit the table. He died right there, right at the table. That was Nero's first murder. Yeah, tragic. No, the empire wasn't big enough for, for two presumptive heirs to the throne. Uh, yeah, the Christians, there were some eschatological uh, freaks in those days, like, you know, they have Hal Lindsey's back in those days, too. Um, part, pardon my bias, I don't want to get started on Hal, it might, I might, you know, go frothing at the mouth. Um, but uh, I, I do, in my book, have Peter talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, and it may take fire to purify Rome, and that, you know, word getting back. I'm not sure he ever said that, but we extrapolate in that uh, Flames of Rome project. By the way, people, uh, you know, thank you for your literary interest. You absolutely wiped out all my supply of books last night instantaneously. And so the bookstore has kindly consented to let them be available to you at the same big discount after I leave. They'll take orders in the next two days, and we'll ship them up from Kalamazoo here immediately. Sign them ahead of time if you like that. And uh, they are available or at a cost basis in the bookstore. Very generous of your bookstore manager to do that, by the way. Any other questions? Well, thank you for hearing me out four and five times. I can't believe that I've been jabbering away this long. Sort of an occupational hazard for somebody who's a chaplain on the one side and speaks, and a professor who also speaks. I think it's called Lugaria. Um, but uh, we've had a good time together. I'm so grateful. And uh, I will say that of the various Staley lectureships that I've uh, been to, and been quite a few over the years, I think this is probably the most uh, responsive and intelligent audience I've had. Thank you. <laughs>